Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter of HurricaneTrack.com here with your first hurricane outlook and discussion for the off-season. So we're going to just start referring to it as the off-season edition of the hurricane outlook and discussion. This is December 4th, 2017, and of course, as you should know by now, the hurricane season officially came to an end on November 30th, and so now these video discussions will focus on the first part, looking ahead towards next year at a couple of the larger puzzle pieces that we can keep track of and that would be the ENSO or the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon in short will there be an El Nino next year and we can keep track of that I think there's a cat creeping by me that's funny um, <laughs> the office cat makes an appearance we will keep track I should name it El Nino uh, we'll keep track of the state of the ENSO and what it may or may not be doing. I'm really not going to be focusing on any forecasts for ENSO because they suck. I mean, they just do. Look at what happened this year. They were calling for El Nino by the peak of the season, a lot of the models. Well, the, the two major camps, the ECMWF and the Climate Forecast System, and there were others uh, suggesting a warm episode in the tropical Pacific, and that didn't happen. So what I want to focus on is what do things look like now? And then we can interpolate from there what to watch for. I call these keys to the game. As you can see by that uh, over there, that Duke Blue Devil. Uh, I watch college, ba college basketball a lot. And you see when the games are getting ready to start, and this goes for pretty much any type of competitive sport, what are the keys to the game? So instead of making a forecast per se, you can look for certain keys that if these conditions are met, we would expect a certain outcome, and the same can be held true for the most part when we're looking at the tropics. Then the second part of these off-season discussions will be looking for big-ticket weather items, big winter storms, and we get into the springtime, any potential flood events that set up. Think about the tax day flood in Houston, the Mississippi River floods of 1993, and there are others. Uh, you know, big weather events that could affect a lot of people. But in particular, I'm looking to see if we get any major nor'easters, coastal storms in the wintertime, sort of the hurricane's second cousins, if you will. And if so, will they warrant a field mission to go and set up equipment? Sort of keeps me on my game. We have a lot to continue to test. The technology is always evolving, and we will be on the lookout for that. So... Let's shrink the camera shot here down to small, move me out of the way, and let's move on with the program, shall we? So looking at the first part here, global sea surface temperature anomalies for today, and you can see there's this pretty large area of colder anomalies here in the equatorial Pacific. That's the official La Nina, whereas most of the tropical Atlantic and even the subtropical Atlantic running above the long-term average if we zoom in here we can see this a lot better there it is the quite cold tropical pacific and then the very warm main development region extremely warm compared to average in the northwest atlantic and it's just something we will keep an eye on it has no bearing on next year's hurricane season right now but let's see how this evolves and so once a week we will take a look at this and see what happens with it. One area where this could matter, all of this anomalously warm water, well, you can just imagine if you get Arctic air and upper level dynamics involved at some point this winter, probably multiple occasions, there will probably be some pretty epic blizzards uh, for the Northeast. One can only hope. I guess you can hope for that, right? Uh, you know, weather's interesting. You gotta be careful what you wish for. That's the, that's the truth. So what did it look like this time last year? Well, quite a bit different this year, especially in the tropical Pacific. Here it is today. This is what it looked like a year ago. The tropical Pacific, quite a bit colder. And the Atlantic Basin, I think overall, is warmer this year. Maybe a tie? I don't know. But no big differences in the Atlantic Basin, and you can see that. So this is one of the things that I like to look at. This is the subsurface temperature anomaly, and this takes a snapshot of what the water temperature anomalies are like. This is the surface, and this is several hundred meters deep. 
So this is a cross section of the tropical Pacific. This is a warm area of subsurface water compared to normal. And this is the large La Nina signature. And we can watch this. And this really helps to tell the future. It's not a forecast, but it, it tells what's going to happen. Like as long as this is in place, you're going to have La Nina conditions. So let's see when and if this erodes and if this grows shrinks, expands, where it moves, where it contracts to, etc. We can track all of that. This gets updated about every week to 10 days, and we will address this and take a look at it a couple of times per month. So right now, the last snapshot was the 29th of November, and you can see, again, just summarizing it, very cold anomalies here at the surface, as well as 150 meters deep with a fairly large area of positive anomalies over here in the western Pacific, sort of trying to balance each other out, I guess, trying to develop a yin-yang. Instead of a La Nina or an El Nino, we'll have a, a yin-yang. Um, and it's kind of weird, look at that, they both have a bullseye. There's the cold bullseye, there's the warm bullseye, and they're trying to, I don't know, it just looks interesting. And this is, again, something that we can keep track of. Now, for those of you that want to go to the beach, along the Gulf Coast, have at it, but bring the wetsuit. Surface temperatures down here cooling off, as you would expect along the shelf water. But anything in yellow and south of this line that I'm drawing in red, including this little circle up here, is still about 80 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. And it's December. The Gulf of Mexico still able to support hurricanes and a good part of it if other conditions were to allow. That usually doesn't happen obviously, but that's interesting. We'll see how quick this is to cool off. You can bet once we drop some major league fronts down here with the cold air advection, the lateral movement, horizontal movement of that cold air that'll bleed down into the Gulf here, uh, and you know it's coming, it's just a matter of time, these surface temperatures will cool off. But today, some parts of the Gulf still nice and toasty, if you have to go out and go fishing or something, it's very warm. And the same can be true here, is true for the Gulf Stream, which runs right through here. And look at these tiny little islands of warmth. There's one right there. There's another one. These are both still 26 Celsius, or if we round it up, call it 80 degrees Fahrenheit, right off the coast of North Carolina. And then you have a very steep temperature gradient. The difference in temperature over distance here very warm in the Gulf Stream and then it drops off to fairly cold in the upper 60s to mid 60s Fahrenheit along the shelf water but all of this water in through here this Atlantic this Northwest Atlantic region running quite a bit the long above the long-term average and so if we get some Arctic air coming in which we will soon and then some upper level dynamics maybe we can get a storm to develop at some point and ride up the coast and make for some interesting times ahead for all the snow lovers out there. That's one of the things that we will definitely be keeping track of, and we can do so with relative ease. I am not a winter storm expert by any means. I know what to look for, but I'm not going to know winter storms like I do hurricanes. Um, I'm much better at dealing with the impacts of winter storms than necessarily forecasting them and understanding their evolution. That being said, National Weather Service products are typically adequate enough to see what's coming and plan accordingly. And so today's snapshot of the lower 48 blizzard and winter storm warnings for the upper Midwest along the Canadian border states as an Arctic front comes down. Uh, we will get a lot of rainfall across this region coming up, thank goodness, because the La Nina is kind of causing a little bit of a drought situation uh, for the southeast as of late. Even in Texas, where Harvey, of course, set... Uh, all-time records it's been fairly dry until just recently and so any additional rainfall as long as it is not excessive of course is going to be welcome in the south and east so this is what we will be watching the 500 millibar pattern and this is great because it shows us this is North America it shows us the jet stream more or less this is energy rotating through and you can see this big trough dipping into the eastern United States as ridging develops over the western U.S. and look at that energy coming around the base of the trough maybe some winter storm potential with some of these bouts of energy that roll through each one of these little areas represents a potential storm in the atmosphere uh, I do know enough to know that 
and it's just a matter of when the dynamics come together. But you can see the pattern changing to much colder in the uh, east as northwest Arctic flow ensues uh, coming out of that pattern over the next week. And by the way, we will look at this on a weekly scale since we're not dealing with tropical cyclones and their delicacies going out beyond five days. The 500 millibar pattern here, a much larger weather feature in the atmosphere. It's like waves in the atmosphere. A little bit easier to forecast out to seven days. It's not going to be accurate per se. That is to say, not exactly what you see here is exactly what's going to happen at days five, six, and seven. But we're not talking about where a hurricane might end up being at days five, six, and seven. We're looking at the pattern instead of individual features in the pattern. So that being said, at day seven, you can still see the overall look here as I scroll back up. Giant ridging here all the way up into Alaska, and that's going to force a ton of Arctic air dislodging it out of this very cold area of the northwestern part of the northern hemisphere down into the lower 48, and that cold air will spill and spread out across this region and flood the southeast and the east with cold air, and then we just have to look and see will we have uh, any potential for winter storms. So that's what we do. That's what we look for here on the off-season version of the hurricane outlook and discussion. All right? So that's it for now. I'll publish these once a week. If we have something big coming, we'll talk about it more than once a week. And then, like I said, hopefully I'll have a chance to go out into the field a couple of times this winter season. And I want to do more on Periscope. I pretty much did zero in 2017. Always changing and evolving with everything, trying to figure out what is the best mix streaming live on YouTube while simultaneously streaming on Periscope as well as streaming to our app and our subscribers of our Hurricane Track Insider. All of that we deal with in the off season to try to refine it and make it better for when it's hurricane season again. All right, so thanks for joining me. I do appreciate it. I am Mark Sutter for HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks as uh, always for watching. I do appreciate it. And we'll talk again in a week.